Now, Dr. Brian Scary <coughs> is the Global Director of Croatian Programs from Sherwin Williams in Cleveland, Ohio, in USA. He's responsible for innovation technologies for corrosion protective coatings for three operating divisions in the company's global finishing group, protective and marine, automotive and aerospace, and product finishes. From 2009 to 2012, he served as global director for the protective and marine division, responsible for product development programs and R&D functions across all global regions. And Brian has been with the Sherman Williams Company for 33 years in R&D management positions of increasing levels of responsibility. He holds a Bachelor of Science Honours degree in Chemistry and a PhD in Corrosion Engineering from what was the well-known Corrosion and Protection Centre at UMIST in the UK, which has now been merged with the University of Manchester. He's authored approximately 50 technical papers on coatings and corrosion and has given multiple presentations on these topics in the Americas, Europe, Asia Pacific and Australasia. In July 2017, he will begin a one-year term as office of office as the president of the Board of Governors of the Society for Protective Coatings, the SSPC, in the USA. Now, Brian is, Brian is a very humble man, and uh, what he failed to mention in that biography that I just read out was that he worked in Melbourne in the early 1980s, and together with uh, Brian Cherry, he produced that landmark report on the cost of corrosion in Australia. So today, Brian's going to present on corrosion prevention coatings from Noah's Ark to nanotechnology. Would you please welcome Brian? Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> and thank you so much, Bruce, for that uh, introduction. I really much appreciate it. Um, so it's a delight for me to be here today. It's a great honor. Thank you very much to the organizing committee, the technical committee of the conference. Uh, it's wonderful for me to be here to have a chance to uh, catch up with some old friends um, from the ACA after so many years. Uh, and uh, as you can probably tell, I'm not the first time attending this conference because for those of you who may have very long memories, I had the honor of presenting the Corrosion Study Update Report to this very audience in Hobart, Tasmania in 1982, so 35 years ago today. So uh, it's uh, great to be back, um, and it's wonderful to have the chance to catch up with old friends that uh, were with them in those days. And I'd particularly like to say that I was very happy to be here today to catch up with my old boss, my mentor, and my friend of life, Professor Brian Cherry from Monash University. It's just great to be back. So, as you can tell um, from my accent, I'm from the United States. Um, and when I was putting this presentation together, you know, I, I realized that in, in this country, in this audience, no one probably knows the company that I, I represent, which is the Sherwood Williams Company in the United States. So I thought we might like just a quick summary of who we are, uh, just to indicate that we are really a genuine paint company. Uh, and uh, our company uh, was founded in Cleveland, Ohio uh, in 1866. So last year we celebrated our 150th anniversary. And by the end of 2016, we had achieved a point where we were, uh, had revenues of nearly 12 billion US dollars, uh, mostly in the Americas, North and South America. And at that point, we were the number one paint company in the United States. But 2017 has been a fantastic year for our company because we have had the opportunity to join forces with another paint company that you probably know much better than us, and that's the Valspar Corporation of Minneapolis. So the two companies have joined forces, and we now have many uh, brands that you can see on the screen here. Uh, many well-known brands, iconic brands, and so on. But it's great for me to have the chance to be here today to catch up with some new colleagues from the Wattle Paint Company here in Australia. Uh, and we're going to have a lot of fun together. Uh, and uh, so perhaps if I get an invitation to come back here and make another presentation in another 35 years from now, uh, you might by that point know show you who's coming next. Okay, so down to business. 
For the next few minutes, I'm just going to run through uh, paints for corrosion protection. And I'm going to give you a quick historical overview of how we've got to where we are today. Uh, I'll talk for a few minutes about metals corrosion like computer. I know everybody in this audience knows a lot more than I do about that topic anyway, so that will be brief. And I'll spend a few minutes talking about the state of protective coatings today, how we test them to make sure that they will close to work for fitness and purpose. And I'll leave you with a little bit of technology roadmap for the future. So we'll cover the ground from Noah's Ark to nanotechnology. Okay, so Noah's Ark, protective coating, yes. I've taken a bit of a liberty here, I know, because Noah's Ark, as far as we know, it was made of wood. But the fact that pictures you've accepted, I thought this would be quite interesting. But over the decades and over the centuries since then, things have moved along a lot. And you can see from the time of the ancient Egyptian, Egyptian and Greeks, that natural materials were used for protective coatings way back when. Uh, and even, I like this one, the Pliny in 1877, as far as I know, the first person to suggest that vegetable pitches could be used to protect iron corrosion, which is pretty uh, early stage thinking, I think. But keep in mind that he also thought equal value uh, would be a suitable religious ceremony. So I, I think if you're facing intractable corrosion problems here in Australia, and the standard technology for corrosion protection isn't working, keep in mind Pliny's approach that maybe a suitable religious ceremony might help you. <laughs> Well, things moved on over the centuries, uh, and uh, there's many interesting facts there uh, that, that um, uh, you know, brought us to the present day, but I think that uh, what's of particular significance in the paint world is that um, the development of synthetic resins for developing paints for corrosion protection really didn't take off until the 20th century, which is really not that long ago. So with workers like Leo von Bateman and so on, the development of phenolic resins uh, brought the accelerated development of many different types of polymer systems, acrylic, vinyl, spray, epoxy, urethane, and so on and so forth. So a lot of progress took place in the 20th century, but as we go forward into the future, there's a lot of technology that's uh, available to us now, uh, and we'll talk about some of them at the end of the talk, including the inevitable nanotechnology. Corrosion, as you all know, uh, is a, a, a uh, a, a wide-ranging topic of concern to industry and society. It's, uh, we will think of it today, anyway, as the unintentional attack on the metal by a reaction against environment. The costs of corrosion are high. Uh, we've always known that for a long time. Um, and uh, even in the United States, uh, we would probably think in between 2015 and 2017, the time, that time frame, the cost is still in the order of a billion dollars a year to the US economy. Uh, some of it's recoverable, some of it's was not. But if you look at the photographs along on the right hand side there, um, you know, we, we often think of corrosion as a fairly mundane, uh, passive kind of activity, but corrosion has led to well known catastrophic failures in the past. Uh, and um, the important thing really is to note that um, paints can be used to slow down the effects of corrosion. Well, way back in the 1970s, uh, Barton published a book uh, which I thought had an interesting statement in it where he really believed that, in other words, he measured that 90% of all metal surfaces are in fact coated with paints. Uh, and uh, coating uh, metals with paint is really to provide aesthetics but also asset protection, and in our case, we think of corrosion protection. So everything, basically everything is, is coated. Now, um, we know that metals naturally corrode because uh, when they're dug out of the ground, it takes a lot of energy to get to this sort of metal material that can be used for construction purposes and industrial purposes. And, and of course, it's not surprising that fairly easily that metal will prefer to return to its natural state of lower free energy levels. And so corrosion is going to take place no matter what. Um, but when we think about corrosion in general, we can simplify the whole process uh, into certain characteristics. And I know everybody here knows this, but if we just think of the corrosion as requiring two simultaneous reactions, the anodic reaction, that's the oxidation of the metal, and the cathodic reaction, where these uh, electrons that are released in this process are assimilated by cathodic reacting species and allow the process to continue. So the oxidation of the metal takes place here, the form of corrosion product, and is driven by this cathodic reduction process, someplace near the anodic site. The presence of, of water uh, is important in many uh, applications of, uh, of paint on corrosion. Uh, and uh, if we can adjust or affect any one or several of these characteristics, then our paint might be able to stop or mitigate the corrosion process. 
In terms of the reactivity of metals, uh, of course, as we go from the normal metals, which are unreactive by gold and platinum, all the way down to highly reactive metals in the water, using particular calcium and sodium, you can see that this electrode drive, of course, is very powerful. Uh, and uh, in terms of many uh, applications that we have, including iron and steel, uh, we can see that um, that driving force in the electron potential difference between iron and zinc is significant enough that we can use zinc to react and corrode preferentially to iron and steel uh, so that it can be used as a galvanic protection um, uh, metal to help protect irons and steels. But of course, you can't use zinc for aluminum because the aluminum is not more active than zinc. So we take into account all of these factors when we're thinking about paint. But overall, the corrosion process depends on two things. The chemical environment, you know, what species are there, and so on. The Some dynamics, is a process possible or not? But perhaps most important of all, in some respects, is the kinetics, the rate of the action that takes place. So in neutral uh, solution conditions, we know that sparingly soluble corrosion products form. Uh, and uh, th these aren't terribly stable. Some of them are, but some of them are not. In acid conditions, of course, we get rapid destruction of metals. And you can get rapid destruction of amphoteric metals in highly alkaline conditions as well. So uh, if we understand what's involved in the chemical environment, we can pay attention to how we design paint uh, to meet the needs for corrosion protection. But fluid dynamics uh, determine whether or not something's even possible. And so for many studies of solubility parameter data, uh, and so on, and using the Nernst equation, we can take another look at the electrode potential characteristics and understand what's even possible and what's not. And these so-called potential pH diagrams or Corbett diagrams are very useful to us when we're thinking about how to put paint formulations together because it allows us to try and figure out what we should put in the paint for a given set of conditions. So if we, if these EPA Corbett diagrams plot redox potential against the pH, and here, for an example for iron, uh, it's similar to steel, really, but you can see that in this spectrum of possibilities here, each segment uh, tells you what's going to happen given the redox potential of the given pH condition. So, uh, across the entire pH frame, below these redox potential levels, iron is immune from corrosion in this entire box. But up here, it's in uh, uh, the region of corrosion. Uh, there's also passivity and even more corrosion if you go too high in the redox potential characteristics. So how can we use this information? Well, let's take a simple example for you. If we take a piece of iron, or steel, let's call it iron, and put it in deoxygenated solution uh, of, of water where there's no oxygen <coughs> present, um, then we would find, let's say, for example, a pH 6, that the electro measurable electrode potential for that piece of iron in that deoxygenated solution would fall somewhere around here. It would fall somewhere between the equilibrium potential for ionized solution and the hydrogen electrode potential. So right there, the word that hill uh, across is located, that red and red algae. So, we <coughs> can it in deoxygenated water. How do we stop it? You have three options. One, you can forcibly reduce the electrode potential of the metal into this region of immunity. How do we do that? Well, we could put a piece of zinc and attach that to the iron to force the iron corrosion uh, real potential to become immune from corrosion. Or we could add oxidizing agents and force that electrode potential high enough up until the, the, the sample reaches this passive region. Or we could increase the pH to get some, at least a reasonable uh, passivity for the, for the iron uh, under these conditions. So using this kind of information, we get some pretty good ideas about what we could do if we had a paint and what we should put in the paint to bring about a thermodynamic change that would allow us to get corrosion protection. But this is only part of the story because we need to know more about the influence of other ions, not chlorides. We need to know more about the localized effects uh, and no indications given at all about the rates of reaction to kinetics. And that's why we need to pay a lot of attention to kinetics. Uh, whether it's activation, uh, energy control, or uh, diffusion control processes, the rate of the process is significant in terms of how we would uh, engineer a paint formula uh, to provide corrosion protection. So, uh, with that in mind, let me tell you a little bit about how paints really are put together and how we believe they, they function. And uh, after all these years, even starting with the, the concepts of the, of, uh, let's say, Noah's Ark, I have to point out that, um, sorry, that um, the, the mechanisms by which coatings and paints work is still pretty complex, and it's not entirely well used for people today. Um, but in general, the function of a paint is not just a physical barrier. Um, coatings, even quite thick, are really quite permeable to oxygen and water. 
is really pretty much always sufficient water can get through and usually enough oxygen. Uh, so our coatings really have to be designed to act on these anodic processes. Uh, there are multi-coat systems, and they often involve two treatments and so on, which I won't get into in too much detail today, but you might want to think of it as the primer coating as really being essentially the most important for corrosion control. And the top coat is there for various purposes. It protects the primer, but it also is used to provide uh, appearance and aesthetics. Uh, but ultimately, coatings can get pretty complicated in terms of the number of uh, layers that are used in an overall design system. So what is important for anti-corrosion? Proteins. Well, uh, film formation is really a critical factor. When we look at the different resin systems that are designed, the synthetic resins I mentioned before, uh, you, they really fall into two categories, waterborne systems and solvent-borne systems. And in the case of solvent-borne systems, this is where we would, would put uh, low molecular weight uh, oligomers and, uh, and polymers together. Uh, and in the presence of a solvent, we can also have uh, pigments and other additives. But the solvent and the resin together uh, over time will cure by solvent evaporation and allow these low molecular weight polymers and elements essentially to cure themselves, react in place to form long chain polymeric systems, which are typically very impermeable to the passage of, of moisture uh, and, uh, and oxygen to an, to an extent. But that is very different from what happens with waterborne systems where hydrophobic polymer groups, like for example acrylic latexes, are bundled together in particles of different chosen particle sizes uh, in the presence of water. And when the water evaporates, these particles essentially join together, coalesce into a big bunch, and ultimately produces a film. But in terms of the physical, mechanical, and chemical properties of these two types of paints, they're very different. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, gives us options, but it also means we have to be aware of how we should design the paint together, given the conditions that we're uh, uh, taking into account for a particular set of circumstances. So all things considered, um, what we find is that paints are permeable to oxygen and water, and the relative difference becomes the permeability characteristics to cross the line. So uh, even though oxygen and water can get to a coating, if you can control the rate of which ions permeate uh, to uh, another catalytic site, you can use this effectively to, to prevent corrosion taking place. And the like chemical activity of components that are added, like oxidizing anions, chromates, and so on, uh, allow you to design a paint that will work quite effectively. But keep in mind uh, that many of these characteristics, dry and region, also influence the overall performance levels of the coating. Um, when you put the coating together, we talk about film properties. Um, it's very significant how much pigment you put in for the amount of resin. And we often look at what's called the pigment volume concentration level. Uh, and uh, as a function of increasing pigment level, we see there's a massive difference in the overall performance characteristics of a given formulation. So uh, the critical performance, the, the critical um, pigment volume concentration is where there's only just enough resin to surround the entire uh, pigment particles that you have in the, in the formula. Uh, and at the, at the get, as you get to that point, the corrosion resistance uh, and blistering characteristics change fundamentally crossing over that CPBC limit. So you have to be very careful uh, when you put paint forms together to take all of these considerations uh, into mind so you end up with a, a paint that's actually functional and effective and fit for purpose. So uh, in simplistic terms, we usually just define coatings as an option of uh, either passive barrier coatings, as I mentioned, where uh, the, the resin or pigment they have relatively low water transmission characteristics, so the paint can be thought of essentially as a barrier. Uh, or active coatings with these uh, inorganic type limited pigments, but it could be organic and other types of pigments are used to influence the overall uh, effect at the end of the pentacolic sites. The third general category is sacrificial methods, and Zingrich primers would represent the most obvious example of very successful technology uh, for um, providing sacrificial. Uh, protection to steel systems and, uh, and, and such things. So, while we talk about passive films and barrier effects, I'll just mention the critical factors associated with pigments that we use. So, resin choice is very important for so pigment collection. And you can use different types of pigment, and sometimes they're described as extended pigments, talcs, micros, or plating. Uh, and in this, the paint that you've designed, if you put flat plate pigments in the paint, you can slow down the rate of water transport through the thickness of the film 
by making the water pathways much more tortuous than if it's just spherical particles, say, in the same formula. Uh, so that's a very important factor to keep in mind when you're designing the paint. But there's other types of pigment too. You can see more or less the light has a acicular uh, form, which helps you design into the coating factors like flexibility and toughness. Uh, and there are other types of pigments too. Calcium carbonate is often used as an extender, uh, primarily because it provides some hiding and it helps you design the coating to get good mechanical properties, and it's also key. Inhibitors, so as I mentioned, the anodic passivation type inhibitors, oxidizing anions like chromates, nitrites, formidates, and so on, uh, these tend to be um, pigmented into a paint such that when the water transports through the paint, these relatively soluble very soluble materials can be dissolved and taken to the metal surface and cause a passive act action uh, often at uh, the anodic sites. Uh, these oxidizing species are non-oxidizing species like for phosphates and so on, um, but uh, if you could produce uh, a mechanism whereby the surface is essentially passivated then the corrosion rate slows down. Um, but there's other types of active inhibitors too that really function primarily at cathodic reaction sites, like zinc phosphate is a good example, where here the uh, material migrates to the cathodes under the water transport front, and it simply slows the corrosion process down at cathodic sites. So essentially here, with these kinds of inhibitors, um, we're really producing corrosion products at cathodic sites primarily, which are just simply more insoluble than the products that would form if you didn't have the inhibitors there. So, <coughs> It gives us lots of opportunities to design a coating uh, to have different characteristics, all of which are aimed at providing good performance and corrosion resistance. But there's many other things that you can put into the coating in terms of corrosion uh, uh, inhibitive um, uh, species. There, there's a plethora of organics that are added, uh, and uh, you see here the list of them. And these all essentially uh, form a, almost like a film uh, uh, formation um, sort of surface of the metal so that it slows down the rate of corrosion like and anodes and cathodic sites. This is more of a kinetic type effect, really, rather than the thermodynamic effect of changing the chemicals in the system. So there's lots of opportunities here uh, for designing uh, coatings for corrosion protection. I'll just mention very briefly the sacrificial zinc rich primer systems, um, because these are tremendously important in terms of practical performance for engineering structures all over the world. There's at least 30 to 40 to 50 years of experience with these coatings. They function extremely well, particularly under the right conditions. There's two types. There's an organic resinous uh, zinc rich primer system, and there's an inorganic uh, ethyl silicate type zinc system. Um, both have their advantages, both have their disadvantages. Uh, both systems essentially function with a degree of zinc.